Swimsuit? Check. Sunscreen? Check. Phone charger? Check. Don't forget to pack the 5 Hour Energy. It fits great in a pocket or carry on, and the alert feeling will help you arrive ready for anything. Now get 20% off when you use code 5HE Travel at 5HourEnergy.com. Expires April 30th. One time use only, not valid with other discounts. Remember, visit 5HourEnergy.com and use code 5HE Travel to save 20%. Hi everyone, I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Flaschenberg. I'm your host for Yoga Birth Babies, and today we're going to talk all about the pelvic floor, the linea alba, diastasis recti, back pain, intra-abdominal pressure. I know I can go on and on and on because I am such a geek for these things. I had set this interview about six weeks ago and I was counting down to get here. I'm so excited. We get a little geeky, but it's fantastic. So during this interview, I speak with Lindsay Vestal and Solange Ross. Lindsay's actually been on the podcast. I think this is her third time with me. Clearly, I adore her because I keep wanting to pick her brain because she's brilliant. She owns the functional pelvis. It's a private practice specializing in pelvic floor therapy. She does house calls for pre and postnatal people. And she's an OT, an occupational therapist. And Solange Ross is a woman's health physical therapist. She's trained in evaluating and treatment of the pelvic floor muscles and the Franklin Method Level 2 Educator. The conversation was amazing and I'm so excited for you to listen to it and share. Now, I will say at times it gets a little heady about anatomy. Work with us. We get some hands-on stuff that you get to feel your own body, but it's such important information. So if you are a pregnant person or just gave birth, or you are an educator, or you are a yoga teacher, this is something you should just take your time and listen to because the information is so juicy and so important because we have to really support the rehabilitation and the, the whole trajectory that pregnancy and birth takes and the postpartum, and we really have to honor the body and support it. So I hope you enjoy this as much as I did. Also, just a few little things, little housekeeping notes. Um, we opened up the registration for the fall teacher training. The spring one is full with a big wait list. We set the dates for the late fall teacher training back in Charlotte, North Carolina at Yoga One. It's our 85-hour yoga prenatal yoga teacher training. I set the date to relaunch the, my online program, Who's Afraid the Pregnant Yogi? I had such a great time. It was so wonderful, and, it, and I've gotten great feedback, so I'm throwing it out there again. And then just a special thank you to Laura, who left a beautiful donation for the podcast. So we have a donation button on our website. So if it's within your means, I just want you to consider that if that's possible. And sometimes it's not about leaving a monetary donation. Sometimes it's an energetic thank you. And you can leave a rating and review on anywhere you're listening to this on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play, wherever. It just helps people find us and hopefully spread the love and empowerment and juiciness of the podcast. All right. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk to Lindsay and Solange. It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper, a woo -er, a hand clapper, a high-fiver? I kind of like the high-five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At ChumbaCasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino-style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses, so don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VGW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Hi, Lindsay and Solange. I am so excited to speak with you. I've been giddy about this conversation, I think, for a month. So, <laughs> you know, because that's the kind of big geek I am about anatomy. So, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for having us, Deb. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. So, all right, let me just give the listeners a little bit heads up about this. So I think it was Lindsay that sent me a podcast maybe two or three months ago all about re-understanding recti diastasis and, um, and the linea alba. And ever since then, it just blew my mind. So I think I reached out to you, Lindsay, 
like soon after that. And then it took us like what a month and a half to get this on the schedule. So this has been brewing for me to understand better and then to share this, not just with our community, but we have a lot of teachers and prenatal teachers so and, and Pilates uh, instructors. So this is just so exciting. But before we get into that, which I'm barely able to contain my excitement, um, if you wouldn't mind both just t- talking a little bit about yourselves and what brought you to this field and, and just, yeah, you. <laughs> Sure. Solange, why don't you take it? (laughs) Hi. So I'm Solange Ross and I'm a women's health physical therapist and I work with women during pregnancy, postpartum, and all stages of life. And really what brought me to this field was my journey in reconnecting to myself as a mom and then using those tools as I worked with my patients. And, um, I am also a Franklin Method educator, and I'm about to graduate from their level two training program, which is all about the muscles and fascia. Yay! (laughs) And um, for those of you that don't know what the Franklin Method is, so it's a student-centered educational system where you use embodying functional anatomy, so actually experiencing how parts of the body work in your body versus just looking at pictures. So there's self-touch, noticing, sensing, and using different types of imagery to improve the way that you move and feel. And this is applicable to every form of exercise and movement in daily life. And I've been spending, since I started this training program, just diving into how can I integrate this in the way that I do my physical therapy evaluations and treatments. And it's really become experiential learning for the patient. So rather than me being the healer and the fixer, I'm the guide in helping them reconnect and find the tools within them that really, really stick. I love that. It gives the power back to the person. Mm -hmm. It gives the power back. And, you know, the work that I was doing before was good, but there's just something so it's liberating about seeing the patient in front of me being like, yeah, you know, like I can feel it from the inside. And then sometimes the cues that I'm giving, which are external and which I'm looking at that, you know, they're like, this feels right to me. So it's like, okay, well, if that feels right to you, then go with that, you know? So I like that it's really helping them get that internal lens and we're bridging the manual techniques and what I see from the outside with what they feel on the inside. Mm, And um, lastly, I'm a mom of three. And every time I do something like this, and I list the ages of my kids, like they keep getting older, which is... (laughs) How does that happen? (laughs) But yet you still stay young and radiant. So I don't know how that happens. You know what? It's the Franklin method and it's just the passion and the joy. So my kids are now, my oldest is 10. Then my middle is eight and my youngest is turning six, or as we call it, she's five and 11 twelfths. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm I'm so happy to be here and just share my knowledge and my passion for helping women just to connect and just to feel better and more connected in their body. Oh, thank you so much. All right, Lindsay, let's hear about you. Yeah. So uh, I'm Lindsay Vestal. I'm a pelvic health occupational therapist and the owner of The Functional Pelvis. And we offer both in-office and in-home visits for clients throughout New York City. Uh, I would say my passion really lies in kind of bridging that pelvic floor rehab with lifestyle modifications while really looking at the psychological impacts that pelvic health really has on our everyday lives. And speaking of time passing quickly, uh, Functional Pelvis just turned five this year. Yay! Um, <laughs> and I've had two really exciting developments uh, this year. So the first is I've hired my first employee, and oh, I'm really wow. proud to say that she's a fellow OT who specializes in women's health. Um, and then the second thing is that I've started offering continuing ed for other occupational therapists interested in pursuing pelvic health. Um, so both are ex- extremely exciting for me. And most importantly, I'm a mom to two, Avery, who's six, and Liam, who's four. I didn't realize our kids are around the same age. I thought yours are older. Oh, interesting. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. I should, they'll be, they, if they were here, they would very qu- quickly tell you that it's not too far. March, they're turning seven and five. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what's fascinating, Lindsay, when you and I met, I mean, you had just had Liam. So that was five years ago. Yeah, so. that's right. When I started functional <laughs> pelvis too. It's crazy. And I will say, um, I'm really You're like, I'm having two kids. I'm going to start a business. When's why, not? why not? You know, not? Life's, life's stressful. Just kind of just throw some, something else at it. Um, but I will tell you that one of the reasons why I'm, I'm really excited about joining Solange with this conversation is we, you know, we're part of this monthly pelvic health study group, um, which we love. Love. It, it just really helps open the community and gets conversations going and supports those of us that love learning. You know, I feel like there's just so much. So it's a continual journey and thank God for that. Mm-hmm. Um, continuing to learn and grow. And we recently had a meeting that focused on this exact topic. And I got to really hear Solange go into the Felden, um, excuse me, the Franklin Method perspective. Um, so I mean, I'm excited to, to have both of our perspectives join in this conversation. I know. I actually, I was um, eavesdropping via Facebook on that one and I was just (laughs) floored by everything that she was saying. So I'm glad that everyone can really jump into this. And I saw some of yours yesterday too, from the Mutu, um, a little bit, I got kicked off online somehow um, about the Mutu method. So I'm really excited. All right, let's jump in. Um, So I think Solange is going to take this. So we've been talking linea alba, abdominal muscles, uh, diastasis recti, but some people that might be listening might not know anything about what we're talking about. So let's back it up and go basic. What is the linea alba and how is it integrated in the abdominal muscles? Yeah. So I'm going to address this through my background in Franklin method. So the linea alba, it's a connective tissue or a fascia and In Franklin Method, we're here to have an experience in our body. So I invite you to, we're going to experience that together right now. So if you come into a comfortable seated position, we're going to feel where that tissue is. So if you go ahead and trace your hands down your sternum, so your breastbone, and if you come to the bottom of the breastbone, so that linea alba tissue, it runs, go ahead and walk your fingers down the midline until you hit your pubic bone. And if you're not sure where your pubic bone is, it's very, very broad. Just generally, if you place the heel of your hand and aim your fingers down, it will land somewhere more or less near it. And if you're not sure, just imagine this big, broad bone. Um, And you could take a look at the pelvis just to have an image in your mind. So we have that linea alba tissue running down our midline, and that's a connect, it's a connection point, or we can think about that as kind of being the hub of the wheel um, where our abdominal muscles all connect into. So it's important to note that we have one layer of muscles in the front of the abdomen and three layers on the sides. We talk about these four muscles, but just the fact that there's one in the front and then the three layers, they live on the sides of the abdomen. So in the front, if you run your hands next to that midline point, just starting at, let's say like the bottom of your bra, your bra strap, like two columns, just trace your fingers down until you hit sort of you know, your, your hip creases. So kind of run down till you hit your hip creases and do that a few times with me. And that is the first layer, our rectus abdominis. And then from here, we're going to take our hands onto the sides of the rib cage. So the first muscle that's on the sides is our external obliques. And we're going to kind of go diagonally down to the front of our pockets. So have that image of sort of like a fan coming down and getting into the front of the pocket. So trace down on that diagonal a few times. And then below the external obliques, we have our internal obliques. So that's coming from, if you now take your hands to the back pockets or the back of your pelvis, and you're going to trace your hands up around the angle of your ribs in the front, If you kind of think about tracing from back to front, sort of like a Christmas tree, brush up in that direction a few times. And then below that, we have our transverse abdominis. So now go all the way to your back and think from the back of the pelvis to the rib cage 
and starting from where you can feel the, the bumps in the back, the spinous processes, and think about to the sides of that. We have our transverse processes, and we're going to imagine and trace going around our waist, so horizontally, like a belt wrapping all the way around from our pelvis to our rib cage. So we have these four layers connecting into the linea alba tissue. And we have four layers connecting, and we also need to have these layers sliding and gliding on top of one another. And what often happens is from not knowing how the muscles move or where they are, these layers can get stuck and they can get adhesions. So how do you, after doing that little touch process, kind of notice how you feel? Okay, I did it. One, I shouldn't have <laughs> eaten before this. It's <laughs> poking my stomach wasn't great, but I actually... <laughs> Uh, if I feel really um, circumferential. I feel really aware, not just in my front plane, but because I was really focusing, like I did, I brought my hands to, <laughs> granted I'm wearing yoga pants, but like what would be back pockets and I wrap yeah. them around. And then I love the transverses. That's one of my favorites. And I kind of, I always think of it like a corset and I massaged around there. Yeah. And I feel very full in my body as opposed to, I feel like when I'm talking or presenting, it's so frontal plane. So this yeah. really made me feel fully aware of the whole body. Absolutely. Do you have anything to share about your experience, Lindsay? I think I just felt so uh, fortified or reinforced, you know, like I, I felt like wow, I have this whole system to protect me. I have this this whole cylinder or canister or three-dimensional aspect to my body and it, it has me. And that's so nice to hear you say that because sometimes we sort of get stuck in this like, oh, I'm trying to like isolate or feel one thing rather just feeling how all of these layers create this circumferential space that we have and how they all connect into that tissue. And we're going to get into later on how that tissue moves. Mm, wonderful. So <laughs> sorry, I'm, just, I'm such a geek. Um, I'm going to own that. Um, so that's how they integrate. So how does the linea alba then affect the abdominal yeah. muscles and its functionality? Yeah. So I think it's important to understand what connect connective tissue does for us, like what fascia does. So number one, it provides containment for muscles. So if we didn't have this, this fascia at all, we, we wouldn't have a structure or a shape. And then especially here with the linea alba, what this connective tissue does is it allows muscles to transfer force outward from their tendons to neighboring muscles. So what that means in English, if that, you know, <laughs> if that was a little bit, ah, is it allows the two sides of the abdomen to communicate with one another. So you can kind of, maybe, maybe this will give you an example. Like if you were to throw a ball overhand, right? If you could just imagine throwing a ball or do the gesture and you were just to throw it and just kind of throw it just straight plane, mm -hmm. how would that, like, what would that do for your abdomen? I'm doing it and I feel I'm using my, <laughs> of course, you're I'm, using your arm. I am or, using my arm, so I don't have a ball. Um, right. So you're, so you're using your arm, right? You're not, you're not using much, but if you were to take your I arm and kind of wind I, it back, but I feel it in the left, well, I'm, I'm a lefty, so I'm using my left and I definitely, <laughs> someone just drove by and I'm looking like, what is she doing? Um, I felt it all the way down through my left side. So it didn't just stay in my shoulder. I really felt the whole left side, the abdomen and body engage. So you felt the left side, but if you were to like wind that arm up now and then actually throw, so to think about using more three dimensions, could you then take it from the left side into the right side of the abdomen? I guess, yeah. 
Yeah, I added a little twist to those. That cheating, right? Yeah, and that's exact <laughs> right. And you actually are adding a twist because you have the external obliques, which on one side come and they insert into the linea alba, and then that connects to the internal obliques on the opposite side. So when we rotate and twist, we're not just using one muscle. We're using like these muscle joints that work together, and we're using both sides of the abdomen in a coordinated way. And that's, that's what that linea alba tissue helps us do. So like the muscles connect into it, but then they also continue onto the muscles into the neighboring side. Yes, I get that. It's pretty cool, isn't it? It really, it really is. <laughs> Waiting on a tax return? Hopefully it ends up in your hands. Fraudulent tax returns due to identity theft increased by 30% in 2023. If you're in a bind this tax season, LifeLock can help. Our U.S.-based restoration specialists are experts dedicated to helping solve your identity theft issues. And all LifeLock plans are backed by the Million Dollar Protection Package. So we'll reimburse you up to the limits of your plan if you lose money due to identity theft. Help protect your information this tax season with LifeLock. Save up to 25% your first year at LifeLock.com slash aware. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. <laughs> The Chumba Life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. <laughs> so, so let's talk about, because um, a lot of what we talk about in pre and, pre and postnatal, we talk about diastasis recti, and I'll just start calling it DR because it's a lot to say. So let's talk about... Linea alba, diastasis recti, DR. And from what I've been reading and what you guys were talking about in one of your Facebook groups was the understanding of what DR is seems like there's some change happening. It's no longer just the gap. It's about the linea alba's integrity. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I would love to talk about that. So you're absolutely right. There is a lot of misunderstanding around diastasis that I think, unfortunately, have left women without the proper tools to heal themselves. And I think that it starts with the the mere fact of what you just brought up, which is that the word is a mouthful to say, (laughs) tomato, tomato, diastasis, (laughs) diastasis, right? So from here on out, just like you, you're going to hear me referring to it as DR, just so that our listeners don't have to hear me fumble through the words myself. All right, so let's start with the basics. Solange provided an amazing explanation of what the abdominal wall is comprised of, right? So four layers of muscles, um, each with their own fascial compartment. And that Linnea alba that's really comprised of those fibrous tissues of the transversus and internal and external obliques. So it's this highly organized network. And Linnea alba is really designed to be dynamic. And I heard this described best by the podcast that I had sent you, um, Deb, but it was uh, Dr. Sinead DeFore. She's actually a PT who has a master's in midwifery education. I did not know that. I know. Oh, isn't that amazing? I, I like her even better now. <laughs> That's When I read that, I was like, oh, I want to know this lady. This is incredible, yeah. right? So she's really forging the path for us in helping us redefine our understanding of DR. And this is this is her explanation, and I just love this. So the, El- the Linnea Alba is really kind of like our cervix. It's meant to thin out in order to for you to have your baby. So in the same context, the Linnea Alba tissue is designed to thin out, become more flexible throughout pregnancy to help you accommodate your growing baby, right? It's really meant to support us in dynamic tasks. So this means 100% of us have this accommodation or this thinning out of the Linnea Alba during pregnancy. This statistic came from research really led by Diane Lee, who's this phenomenal Canadian PT who's on the cutting edge of research on this topic. And fortunately, I had the pleasure to study with her. And I have to say, I love her messaging because it really helps us reorient ourselves to the natural design of the body and to not fear this separation, right? So if our body is doing what it was naturally designed to do, that's like, that's freeing. That's so liberating, I think. Mm-hmm. And so then I'm often asked, well, then when are we concerned about the DR being potentially problematic, right? So 
Um, we usually evaluate this postpartum since 100% of us get it during pregnancy. And I, there's this study that I came across uh, that 40% of separation can persist at six months. And this is why working with someone like a PT or an OT who really understands the deep core system, which we will explain later, um, is very helpful to, in order to help you reestablish, restore, rehabilitate the tissue. So here we go. We've already started with our myth debunking. This is number one. <laughs> Understand that it's normal to have accommodation in the Linnea Alba during pregnancy. It's biologically normal and helpful. And then that moves us on to our next big myth, which you've already touched on, Deb, that DR is defined by the separation or the gap in the Linnea Alba. Can okay. I ask one question? Can yeah, I jump go in? right ahead, please. Oh, so... We know that it's totally normal and expected to have, uh, a, you know, this thinning, which we need to accommodate. But at some point, maybe it's now or maybe it's later, can we talk about, like, things that people are doing to make it worse? Because, you know what I mean? Like, I see I see some of these Instagrams, and those that have been listening to the podcast, like, oh, Deb and her Instagrams again. But, like, I see these deep, deep, deep back bends with these big pregnant bellies, and that's just adding more exter- more intra-abdominal pressure forward. So do you, at some point, can we talk about, yes, it's normal to have some, but that our actions can make it more problematic? Yes. If you don't mind. Um, we can just table that. I, table that, but let's definitely okay. bring that back up because I think that's, that is a really important conversation. Okay, great. Okay. So myth number two, um, in the past, we've defined DR by that gap. Um, and by the way, when we talk about gap, it's technically defined as anything bigger than 2.74 centimeters or 2.74 finger widths. So basically, if you can get three fingers in that Linnea Alba, in that center area, that has been the classic working definition of DR, okay? I want to challenge that and say that instead, it, it's also about our ability to generate tension or support underneath the Linnea Alba, okay? This is what truly determines our ability to support ourselves. It should generate tension almost as if it's like a tendon that can optimally transfer load throughout our body. And how do we do this? We do that op optimal transfer through our deep inner core system. So, uh, we really want to kind of assess that connective tissue and the function of the entire core system, which leads me to my last myth buster. And that is that the DR, that DR should be considered within the context of the inner core and the pelvic floor. And I mean, this makes sense, right? It links so importantly to the system. And by this system, by this inner core, I'm talking about the pelvic floor. I'm talking about the diaphragm. And that's kind of like the top and the bottom of the system. I'm talking about transversus abdominis, and I'm talking about some spinal muscles on the back of the body. You can even throw the epiglottis in there. Um, that's getting really geeky. So let's let's just keep it. <laughs> let's just keep it to the pelvic floor and the diaphragm and the TA. Um, but DR is a condition that should be considered from the perspective of the behavior of the Lena Alba, Alba, its ability to support the contents inside, and really focusing on the co-activation of this inner core team, because this is what actually improves core function. And Deb and Solange, what's so funny about this whole like inner recti distance thing or measuring the gap is that when a person actually improves their functional strength, we often see the Linnea Alba get, getting wider. Okay. And this is, we've seen this through the use of real time ultrasound. So if the gap gets wider, but simultaneously we're seeing decreased symptoms, whether that's urinary incontinence, back pain, whatever, whatever the symptom may be, it really gets you to question this whole narrowing the gap fixation. So real time ultrasound is this game changer when it comes to studying the behavior of the Linnea Alba and the inner core. I love that because everyone's obsessed with what's my gap? How many fingers are you getting in there? So I didn't put this on our questions, but I'm going to throw this in there and you probably are going to talk about it anyway. So we're probably having listeners that are like, I want to know what, what my gap is or what my, what my <laughs> tension is, or we're talking about, we want to have some tension there. So let's, how would somebody, how would you describe to someone their home probably not listen to this on the subway doing this, and they want to check <laughs> the integrity of their linea alba. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll take a stab at this and then Solange, if, if you want to jump in, I'd love to hear your perspective. Um, but, um, so let me, let me kind of talk the listeners through how they can check their own. Um, okay. and, I, and uh, so basically uh, the, I want to start off though, by saying there's not much that can go wrong with this check. Okay. Think of it sort of like a belly massage, optimally not after you've had food, Deb. <laughs> <laughs> And I say this because I have a lot of clients who share with me that they're concerned about doing this check. They're worried they could be doing it wrong. And what I say is give it a try. It's your body. You're simply learning more about it. Okay. So let's, if you guys want to join me, um, lie on your back with your knees bent. That's just the, the optimal way to do it. Um, almost like your start, like the starting position for a bridge pose. Think about you're, you're about to go into a bridge. Keep your head down first. Okay. Take Take two or three fingers and start up at the top of the rib cage. We call this the xiphoid process, kind of like where your bra line is. Push down with a little bit more pressure than you think you need because you're assessing tissue here. Okay. Most people, when I see them doing it, they're just kind of like they, they're barely grazing the surface. I want you to put a little bit of pressure. Once you get a sense, yep. Once you get a sense of what it feels like at that xiphoid process rib cage area, move your fingers down a few centimeters and do it again. Okay. So you're going to keep doing this all the way down to that pubic bone that Solange introduced us to. And you're feeling for kind of like a trampoline with an end feel. That's optimal tissue. So an end feel versus no end feel. In other words, you can keep sinking down. If you can keep sinking down, that would be a demonstration of sort of lack of tension. Um, once you've done it this way, I want you to try it with your head up just a few inches. And you're basically looking for another way to think of it is el like we call it elastic recoil. How far down does your finger sink? And then you, while you're there, go ahead and, and take a look at how many fingers you can get in there as well. And that's what I, that's, that's what I, that's what I generally recommend um, my clients to do. Yeah. I think it's important. I teach them, I check everyone that comes into postnatal because I know there are things we can do that can worsen things. So I want to make sure I'm being mindful and I teach them how to check at home because they come in yeah, like you know, a couple definitely. of weeks, like, how is it? And like, well, you, you tell me, so let's explore it. That's and right. I find people feel really excited again. They're it's when it's giving power back to them. What's going with my body? So okay. I have to, I just did the exercise. Now I will disclose I had a pretty big hernia after my kids. So I did have that repaired. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not the ideal person to, to figure out diastasis because it's been uh, closed up. Um, but yeah, it's interesting just to get your hands on your own body mm -hmm. and be curious and have that permission. Like, it's my body. I can work with it. I can see what's going on. I can get feedback. That's such an important message. Um, you know, I had mentioned the thing about the parallel between like the cervix and the Linnea Alba, this idea of accommodation. Another way we can think about how that end feel is the same way I've heard my childbirth educator talk about like the difference of the, of the cervix. So like, mm -hmm. have you guys ever heard this where you can touch your nose, right? Yeah. So touch, mm -hmm. touch the tip of your nose, <laughs> but also squeeze your earlobe. And that's a different, there's a different pressure there. There's a different recoil there. And so that could be another way for you to wrap your head around a little bit, like the feeling of um, how your abdominal wall changes all the way from that rib cage xiphoid process area down to that pubic bone. I will disclose that most people feel a change around their belly button area. Mm -hmm. That's not everybody, but I would say that that most women tend to tend to notice a bit of a change there. So I want to jump ahead. I'm going to bop around our questions. So we're talking about someone might be feeling their their abdomen and, and feeling okay. I'm you know I kind of have that trampoline feeling at the top, but then again I'm near. I'm now maybe three fingers down from the xiphoid process in that whole area. I'm feeling kind of like a marshmallow. I'm really going deep in there. How does someone then rethicken that or repair it or find that integrity again? Salon, do you want to take that yeah. one? <laughs> yeah. So, so first, let you know. I'm I'm going to talk about um, a little bit about my in my evaluation process, like what I will ask the patient to do when we're feeling depth. So as we're walking down, and let's see, like where we feel more more depth, and if if we're in that three inches below. So I will ask them, can you? contract your pelvic floor, like whatever it means to you to contract your pelvic floor, do that. 
and let's see if we feel a difference. So right, all, right, right off the bat, I'm asking them to try something different that maybe they haven't thought about. And I'll have my hands there and I'll have their hands there and I'll see, do I feel a change in the tissue? I may or may not. And then I'll ask them to give me a, give me a transverse contraction. And I'll see, does that change things? And oftentimes by giving them the imagery of the transverse or having them do something, it will right away and they'll feel a very subtle difference. And that'll be really, really encouraging to them that like, look, it's like we haven't even done anything with exercise or movement yet. And you could feel that what you felt as increased depth, now you can feel that like there's a little bit more support below there. And now we need to get you more connected to that. So I will do those two things in my evaluation process. Um, and I think in terms of rethickening the tissue, you know, it's really, really interesting. So when I see a lot of women, they are afraid to move, right? They don't want to do something that's going to make it worse. And they are often in a, a pattern of sort of bracing or not moving. And so this is coming from my recent training in Franklin Method with the founder who is attending all the conferences on fascia. So when we don't move, what we're slowly doing is we're turning off the cells called the fibroblasts, which produce the proteins, the elastin and collagen in our fascia. So what drives the production of these cells is our movement. So how our body moves, the postures that we're in, the loads that we're under. So if we are not moving or bracing, we are actually not stimulating the cells that we need to produce. And furthermore, you know, when you don't move, right, have you ever, you know, been, you know, you haven't done stuff for a week and your body feels stiff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that stiff, <laughs> that stiffness that we feel. So we're we're experiencing the collagen properties of the of the fascia. So that stiffness is when we don't move, things get more bound down or adhered. So kind of glued together. So we need to get that tissue in the linea alba moving and thinking about the linea alba and underneath. So we have those layers of tendons of the abdominals, we want that tissue to slide and glide on top of one another rather than just not moving or holding it in one position, which is not going to give the tissue the stimulation that it needs to rethicken. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, I understand that. That makes a lot of sense. All right. So I'm bopping around. So I'm going to go back to, sorry for my brain. I'm just like thinking here, we're talking here. So I'm just moving around. So let's go back a little bit to DR. And if someone does have it and they're, they're recognizing there's a loss of integrity of the linea alba, how, how does it affect their pelvic health and back pain and just living in general? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, so this is a really interesting statistic that I came across. 66% of women with DR have at least one support related pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. So this could be like urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, um, which let me just make a little plug. Deb and I did a, a really interesting podcast on prolapse. So Are you if you have talk any about questions, the chicken? <laughs> no, I'm not going to talk about the chicken today, but they can totally pop over and listen to that because I think we did some really good uh, debunking of myths in that one too. Yeah. Um, so again, we can see there's this deep connection with DR and the inner core team. If 66% of women who have DR have one, you know, a support related dysfunction. So when we thoughtfully consider how to heal DR, I really suggest working with someone who is aware of this new research, because I'm going to tell you, it's probably, I don't know, four or five years old at this point. And sometimes it can take 10 or more years for research, the geeky lab research to make its way to mainstream fitness. So, you know, really work with someone who isn't just assessing the gap, um, who someone who can focus on 
the knowledge of the deep inner core system because, you know, again, the function of the Linnea Alba is really interdependent with it. Um, there's that clear connection in our research. So pelvic floor, abdominal muscles work together. So you need to ensure you know how to properly engage inner core to activate your core. I, I really feel like that's number one. Um, I would say next that another important message is for women who have had C-sections, which, you know, is basically an incision right through the transversus abdominis. If they've had a C-section or if they've had perineal tears during birth, like Solange said earlier, scars really affect a tissue's ability to move. So if you have DR, if you have pelvic floor issues, getting that fascia, getting that connective tissue, gliding and sliding again. And you can do that, by the way, on your own. On my website, um, Functional Pelvis, I, I have a video, I have handouts that I've created because I just feel like this is free information that everyone should have after they've had a birth. Unfortunately, not every woman is getting this important scar massage information at their checkups. So check it out. You can totally do this on your own. It's a great process to kind of reconnect and reclaim your body, and at the same time, have a positive impact on both your Linnea Alba, your connective tissue, and your pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also important for um, our listeners to understand why that happens, that the connective tissue, it's continuous with the diaphragm, and the connective tissue is also of the linea alba and the abdominals is connected to the pelvic floor. So it's if we can think about it as being many different layers that are all connected, so we can't just not address these pieces. And frequently what I what I get in my inquiries is, you know, it's all about DR and just concerned about the appearance, the cosmetic aspect of it. And in my line of questioning, I always ask what's what's going on with the pelvic floor, and I'll say any incontinence. And even with that, I'll have to really clarify and say, do you leak when you cough or sneeze? Because what incontinence means to people is, you know, not that they, they may they, maybe they think that you know I'm wearing a pad and it's having it, and I'm leaking with all my movements, mm -hmm. but they'll say, oh yeah, it's when I cough or sneeze, but I don't have incontinence. So I really have to educate them that, look, that we have to get you understanding how your pelvic floor works, because though that may be common, right, that's not normal function. And also asking about the lower back, are they having any pains in the lower back and having them understand that that same connective tissue, so coming from our internal obliques and our transversus, that's what connects to the deep stabilizing muscles of the back. So if we, if we don't address the health of the lower back, we're, you know, we're not seeing the big picture and they're coming and they just want to focus on the abs, but it's our responsibility to, in our questioning, Absolutely. get them to become aware of, you know, the larger picture, how the whole system interacts with one another. And I think, yeah. I think that yoga teachers have an amazing opportunity here to do that because, you know, Solange and I are often seeing clients who, you know, they're at that point where they are having some leaking, they are experiencing, you know, some low back pain. Whereas, you know, when you're in a yoga class, you may not be at that point. And, and what an awesome opportunity to, to provide this really positive, accurate information in a, in a setting that's, you know, welcomed and encouraged and, and optimistic. Thank you. No, I, it's something we take very seriously at prenatal yoga center checking. I'm actually surprised and slightly disappointed. One of the first things I ask is how's your pelvic floor and did anyone assess your pelvic floor or your abdomen at your six or four week checkup? And, and I'd say a good 70% say no, no one talked to them about it. So then they're just not knowing what to do. And if they're leaking, all they think is, Oh, I better Kegel and squeeze everything yeah. I can. And we know, you know, there can be you know, overly engaged, you know, they can actually be creating more problems without the support and knowledge. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think it's so important just to have the understanding of just teaching where those muscles are and feeling how they work together with breathing. Mm -hmm. So they just get a sense of like, what, like, can I just become aware of there being this, this movement 
throughout my body? You know, can I be aware when I breathe what what my abdominals are doing? And can I feel a relationship between the abdominals and the pelvic floor? I've also seen some people when they breathe, though, because we talk about diaphragmatic breathing and using the diaphragmatic breathing to gently help stretch the pelvic floor because we want it to be springy. And I see people start to push their bellies <laughs> out. Yeah. You know? yeah. So can, um, yeah. can we address that a little bit, like yeah. what that does and the intra-abdominal pressure and how it affects DR and the linea alba and, and just healthy breathing? <laughs> that's, a, that's a big question. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think maybe the first place that we should start off with is just kind of an embodiment of the diaphragm. And I invite you to just as an experience, right? I'm sure that if you were in your living room, right, you can have a sense of what's around you, how many things that you could see and describe to someone, right? You have a pretty good sense of what's there. Mm -hmm. But if I were to ask you, tell me um, about your diaphragm, (laughs) what's above it, what's below it, behind it, next to it, what would you say? Okay, well, do you want me to go into what I think? (laughs) (laughs) I do feel confident, but I get what you're saying. Like a lot of people, you know, we're, we're, we have we have the knowledge about it, but I think the average person might think, "Hey, this muscle that you know, how many breaths do we take a, a, a day? Twenty thousand breaths a day, right?" Yeah, yeah. Well, this I would say that- a lot of people do not know about their diaphragm because that's something <laughs> we teach transverse abdominal exercise in every prenatal class. And I start talking about the movement of the diaphragm and I liken it to like a jellyfish moving and, and that relationship to the pelvic floor. And I have to tell you many times I bring out pictures, we have a pelvic floor, we bring our hands around. I have to really be clear about like, it's your respiratory diaphragm. Here's where it is. There's the in, And sometimes I've said diaphragm and people after class are like, do you mean the birth control? I'm like, I mean, no, like quietly, like in the corner. So yeah. I would say the average person that's not into body yeah. work probably doesn't even know what the respiratory diaphragm is. So let's feel where it is. Okay. So, and I think it's good too to look at a look at a picture and have an image of it as well. But if we think about our, if if we go to kind of above the xiphoid process, sort of kind of like somewhere around your bra strap. So if you trace your bra strap around towards the front, so the diaphragm, it's a dome-shaped muscle. The upper part of the dome is kind of resting at the level of our bra strap or our nipple line. And then the diaphragm is the most the innermost muscle inside our rib cage, and it's filling out that whole space. So it attaches to our lower six ribs. So if you feel in the front, that angle around your ribs, but don't think external, think really internal. Mm -hmm. And if you go ahead and trace the angle of your ribs and keep going around the sides of your body, connecting to the lower back and the, mm-hmm. and the spinous processes where the bumps that stick out in the back. So it fills out the whole inside of the rib cage. And then if you scooped your abdominal cavity away, it has attachments going to the last thoracic vertebrae and the first, second and third lumbar vertebrae, right? So it's filling out the rib cage and then it's attaching attaching to the thoracolumbar junction and the lumbar vertebrae on the inside. And that this muscle now, right, it has to move when we breathe. So I would invite people to now take a breath and see what do you, what do you notice happening? The rib cage expands and the the belly expands, not just in the front, but I really feel like, again, the whole body has a little bit inflation. And then as I exhale, there is a surrendering of the breath out. Yeah. So, and if we think about it, so this dome, when we, when we take a breath in, right, so it's going to move down in the body. Mm-hmm. And as the dome moves down, it's going to compress our internal organs, right? And the organs can't move back. Why? Because there's a SAR spine is in the back. Mm -hmm. So they're going to get pushed down and forward. So 
your comment to seeing, you know, like people really pushing their belly out, we want to remind people that this organ's getting pushed down and forward. So what the abdominals do is they actually respond to the movement of the organs by lengthening. So there's a gentle lengthening and the same thing, that's what the pelvic floor does as well. It softens and lengthens and accommodates what's being pushed down and forward. And then that's what creates this elastic recoil to then draw back. So when we exhale, what has lengthened now generates this energy which contracts and draws back in and things get pushed back and up. How beautiful and, is that? Mm, no, I love it. I, I still see jellyfish in my brain when I think. <laughs> and, jelly, and jellyfish is, is really nice because, you know, it, it gives you this like – this freedom of movement, because a lot of people have this pattern of just gripping and holding the muscles around the rib cage. Mm -hmm. So if we're doing that, we're not going to get this, we're not going to resemble a jellyfish. And also that idea of like, the jellyfish, and I'm, I'm even like gesturing with my hands. I know, every right time now. I do it, my hands come <laughs> off, both of them, because I'm thinking respiratory diaphragm and, and pelvic floor working together. So, and just think like that movement that, like, as you're moving your arms, if you're doing it with At me, like, I am. my elbows are kind of going out to the side. Uh-huh. Like, that's the movement of my ribs, right? Yeah. And if we think too that like the ribs, they're moving in all different directions, right? So there's some of the ribs move forward, some move side, some move back. So we want to just allow the rib cage to be mobile and get all the the movements. Yeah. So can you go if into then? Oh yeah, keep going. I'm, I don't want to interrupt. Go. Oh, I was going to say if, if if it's okay, I just wanted to add a little bit to that, which is that um, I think a lot of people are concerned that they're chest breathers. You know, I think there was this this big sort of move movement where people felt like, especially here in New York City, right, we're all so stressed, running around, and we think that we become this accessory muscle breather where it's all in the chest, it's all in the shoulders, all in the neck, and so I think that we exchanged that one form of dysfunctional breathing pattern for another, which became belly breathing, right? We were told, Mm -hmm. oh, it's so much better for the body. It's so much more efficient. And so you saw this exchange from the chest to the belly, um, which, you know, can be like a forced exchange. And that that's really, that forceful exchange is what can really promote b- that pure belly breathing. It can really give you, actually add a lot of tension to the whole system. Um, so I think the this beautiful description that Solange gave us was this sense of three-dimensionality, this sense of the side body moving, the back of the body moving, so that it's this three-dimensional, three-dimensional canister that shares the load. It's not the job of just the abdominals. It's not the job of just the chest. It's a job of the entire circumferential three-dimensional system. And I might even add to consider the spine in this because, you know, when you actually inhale, your spine goes into a little bit of an extension. Your body kind of moves up and back and then on the exhale, it moves down. And so I think that's where chest breathing got a bad rap, but actually like beautiful full body diaphragm breathing does involve movement movement of the chest and the thorax and the belly and the back and the side. And one of the things, one of the responsibilities I think that we have as we really start understanding this is to pay attention to the signs that our body is giving us. So in other words, if we're breath holding to accomplish a task, if we're, which is like, like Valsalva, if we're Mm -hmm. leaking urine, these are all signs that people sometimes push past or maybe don't even recognize in the case of breath holding that they're using that as a strategy. To me, um, you know, modify while your deep core gets organized and starts to communicate again. So these are signs that your body isn't quite ready for that task And it doesn't mean it's all, you know, doesn't mean you can't go back to that activity. You're going to, but take a step back, realize that message that your body is sending you and, and take a step back to reorganize with that deep core system. Yeah. I like that you mentioned the Valsalva because I find it interesting that that's how it's instructed for often for that second stage that they're holding their breath and pushing down. And I think, again, I'm putting myself in that category. I had a very long second stage with my first and and I had 
a fair amount of TR after. And I'm sure like if you're holding the breath in, everything's expanding and then you're pressing down, you're having that internal pressure really fraying and and thinning that linea alba. And we don't just do it in birthing. Think about I think about people in yoga classes when they're holding their breath trying to strain, you know, learning how to work with the breath and not cause damage. That's exactly right. And so, you know, birth, birth is, is, I I love considering birth. I, I, you know, I'm so glad you brought that up. I think that's incredibly important and guidelines that have come out recently have discouraged Balsava have, you know, again, it's going to take a while for that stuff to, to get the message. But I encourage every single one of every single listener right now to just really also consider 20,000 breaths a day, 12 to 20 breaths a minute. Those are real tangible everyday opportunities to breathe well. And I think if we breathe well in everyday life, the activity or the demand of giving birth or picking up a car seat or lifting up my seven, almost seven-year-old 55-pound <laughs> daughter this morning, you know, my my reflexive core can really kick in and I can breathe well. If I'm if I think about everyday life as an opportunity to do those tasks and do that and get the demand of my body in line with what I what I actually need to be doing. And I think it's it's important too to have an experience of what what it feels what what actually it feels like in the abdomen when we're continuously breathing versus if we're holding our breath or we're actually engaging all the time. Mm-hmm. So I invite you to place your hands underneath um, underneath the angle of your ribs and just take a breath in, and we can imagine the diaphragm moving down the expansion of the ribs, that three-dimensional movement. And when you exhale, what do you feel happening under your fingers? There's a, everything's kind of drawing back in. They're drawing in. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now I invite you to, so engage your core, right? Mm -hmm. So hold that position where they're drawn back in. And keep your fingers there. And so does that sensation of things drawing in change? Okay, say it again. So I'm exhaling and engaging. Right. And And then you're holding that. And now you're holding that. So what was a drawing in? Do you still feel that as a drawing in? feels a little more static. I don't like holding the abdomen in like that. It actually, my nervous system does not like that um, so when I contract everything. Yeah. So that, and many people are doing that in these holds and what that is, that contracting everything that actually, like if you keep your hands there, I don't know if you can get a sense that that becomes a pressure out into our hands or a pushing out. Mm-hmm. So what was at the end while we were exhaling was a drawing in, we're not allowing that tissue to then expand and then contract again. We're holding it. So we're actually pushing out. And what that's doing is it's putting pressure against our linea alba and our connective tissue. So it's kind of like a constant force pushing out against something which may be overstretched or weakened. So, so in the effort that people are like, oh, I better retone, I better hold, they're actually possibly creating more problem. Right. Rather than working with breathing, right, which is getting the things constantly moving and in sync together, right? Mm-hmm. And you can feel the drawing in and then the expansion, and then the drawing in, you're getting a constant pushing against this tissue. Mm-hmm. And I'd love to add um, about, again, about the sort of this awesome, awesome opportunity for yoga instructors um, to consider. We I don't think we can talk about breathing without talking about the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system and sort of the power that it has to calm us and to organize us. And, you know, right, it's it's simply like the blood pressure drops in our body, the heart rate slows down, and we really have a chance to not just react, but to respond, you know, to, mm-hmm. to really be considerate in our in everyday life decisions. And so I think it's worthwhile to the consider the power of the winding down of the sympathetic nervous system through breath, but also participating in activities that relax you, recharge you, because 
the autonomic nervous system can definitely create like this extra tension throughout the body that you guys are talking about, this sort of like suctioning, like saran wrap in connective tissue. So remember if the diaphragm is part of this inner core system and the breath is like a down regulator for the nervous system, doesn't it make sense that in a state of like present ease, both physically and mentally can be beneficial for restoring core function? Yes, absolutely. That's why we try. I mean, that's why. And even though, so we offer in our postnatal, I always put in restorative because even though a lot of the the postpartum people come in and they're like, I want to work out, I want to work out. We really do want to honor the body's need to rest and recharge and usually often kind of let go and get the, the nervous system regulated again. It's so important. I think so overlooked, especially in New York where everyone's walking around maybe a little um, overly engaged in their nervous system. And I think it's important as people are walking around for them to recognize, you know, like, am I walking and allowing my diaphragm to move up and down? Or am I walking with my shoulders up and I'm bracing against everyone? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. So, and what's, and what's happening in those moments when things are really, really stressful at home, right? Am I able to kind of like use these tools that I practice in an exercise setting and really integrate them into what's going on in their life where they're doing that much, much more of the time. Mm-hmm. So what's happening every time you bend, when you reach the carrying positions, right? Are we still allowing our breath to move in those positions? Are we still connecting to the diaphragm movement that we're having our breaths, even though let's say we're rocking our baby and there's now we have a load, so it's not going to be as much movement, but that we're not in this brace, right? And we're not in this heightened state. Right? If we just breathe in that, like, wow, we can take this stressful situation and bring us down a little bit. Mm -hmm. I want to start to shift it a little bit more because so many of our listeners are doing yoga or yoga teachers or Pilates or whatever, just movement. So what should we be aware of when we exercise and move in daily life that could affect the linea alba, DR, and pelvic floor issues? Yeah. So I think what we want to look for is be aware of the doming or the coning in the exercises that we're doing. So, and if we see that, our first reaction shouldn't be, ah, freak out. (laughs) (laughs) It should be like, okay, right? Like it's, you know, like this is a normal part of pregnancy. You know, like we see this postpartum. So the first thing, can I do something different in that same exercise? Can I do something different? And whether that's, you know, doing something with the pelvic floor, with the transverse, with the position of the rib cage to see if I don't see that movement. And then if, if that doesn't work, am I able to modify the position in some way? So maybe make the range smaller or change the position, right? See if, see if I'm able to play or, or, or vary how I'm doing it. Like maybe I'm used to doing like the same thing all the time. And I just need to make a tiny shift in how I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's really an individual. And I kind of want to go into your, you know, the deep back bends. Yes, right? yes, deep yes. Bend. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, like there's there's a lot of this fear of what are the the movements that I'm going to do that are going to put pressure on this tissue that are going to make things worse. And I think it's important to understand that everyone's body is different that I've seen some people doing a lot of stuff that I know would not be good for me, but they do it in a very, very embodied and connective way and connected way. And I think they, you know, at the end of the day, they're making a choice. If that pose is very important to them and they're able to, to do it and be mindful and understand the tissue, then that may be, that may be fine. I think we can't, I think it doesn't do good to say like, let's, not do those things. And let's say this, this is bad. You can't do that because I mean, we don't know for sure. I mean, I think the only thing we know for sure is that when we don't move at all and are afraid to move, we're going to create more tension and more pressure in our bodies. And we have to also look at the fact that 
these movements, flexion, extension, how we're moving, that, that's all part of daily life, right? So like if we're leaning over against, you know, like, like we're leaning down to pick something up over the floor, that's working against gravity, right? So that's kind of, that can be a form of a plank, right? Or when we're turning to talk to our neighbor, you know, and have a conversation, that's a rotation right there. And that might be similar to what we're doing in like a side twist, right? So these movements, these are, this is a natural part of daily life. So if we understand where the muscles are, how they connect into the linea alba and do it in a mindful and safe way, and maybe work with someone who can guide us to what give us some external cues and merge that with what they're actually feeling internally and to be aware of, are you feeling a a pushing out or a pressure or, or a bad stretch sensation? Yeah. I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think like, I remember teaching this was years and years and years ago. Um, I had a student, she was doing the maternal fitness method and she wouldn't do any twisting any twisting, like literally like we're going to twist above the bra strap. No, like she would move her trunk as if it was like (laughs) a solid piece. (laughs) Like I think she would move her neck. Um, so that was the extreme. But then when I think about yoga and what I start to assess in our postnatals, you know, what's the integrity of the linea alba and then how far am I going to take someone to twist? Now, if someone, if I have a class and I've identified, all right, there's definitely some softness of that linea alba. I want to be mindful. I'm going to back them out of the twist that I I would take them into it because I think it's great for the back muscles and it's functional movement, but I would stop them from going as deep as yeah. somebody else is going. So with honoring the movement, but being mindful of the range of movement, would that sound accurate? Absolutely. And I think we could, why don't we even experience how the linea album moves when we move through all of our movements in the spine? And what you can do with this is tracing down from your xiphoid to your pubic bone. And you could even, if you have a band, you could place it along to give your body some input. Mm -hmm. And if you're seated, what you can do here, so we're going to do like a starting like a cat cow, but slowly move. And can you think about your movement integrating the whole tissue, right? So as you're slowly rounding your spine, can you touch all the way down and notice where, where is more of the movement coming from and where it's not coming from so much? Can you touch a little bit more there? And as you begin to extend your spine, see, can you touch this line and kind of stay connected so that you're using the tissue kind of in a uniform way versus hinging at one point Mm -hmm. and doing whatever, however you feel comfortable moving. So slowly curving and touching along the whole line of the linea alba and extending. And so now keeping one hand at the top and one hand at the bottom, we're going to go into a side bend. And can you, as you slowly side bend, can you, again, think about this connect, this this whole tissue moving? So kind of being like, it's not just one part moving sharply. It's like the whole line of the linea alba is moving uniformly through it. And whatever, whatever you feel comfortable, that's what you're doing. And can you feel how, as you're moving to the side, the, the top hand is moving over, right? Do your hands stay in the same place or do you feel the top it hand? Movement. Moving? It, it's movement, right? And now go ahead and do a rotation. So you're going to rotate your spine, right? So this tissue, right, it's designed to be flexible and to have movement. So it's designed to move with us when we move, right? It's designed to be flexible for breathing, right? You have all these muscles that attach and a big role of the abdominal muscles is breathing. So if it weren't flexible, we wouldn't be able to breathe. It would, it would restrict our breathing. And so as you continue to rotate staying connected to the linea alba and then maybe come back to the center. And as I keep my hands there and as I was moving, I kind of just have this really centered, it's this centered feeling, right? I sort of just that input with my hands and just sort of the understanding that yes, this tissue should move. It kind of gives me a really a connection to all the layers of the muscles working and not gripping and not 
I guess my hands being there too, it's kind of like, oh, that, that feels really safe and comforting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel that. So, you know, how can you apply something like that? So having that, doing something like that, maybe in class and just saying like, as you go, can you just go to the point where like you, where it feels safe to you, right? Where it feels safe, realizing that this tissue has to move. So every time we're doing this, right, we're thinking about those layers of abdominals sliding and gliding underneath. Like if we weren't doing this and we were just holding in one position or limiting our rotation, we wouldn't be getting that. Mm -hmm. And we need that. That rotation is transferable to what we do every day. Like we're walking. What do you think is happening to the abdomen when we're walking? No, I, I know there's this movement, of course. Yeah. No, I don't want to hold people stiff. I just want to create a sense of mindfulness of not yeah. hitting an extreme. And I feel like right. I see that um, a lot. There's like, I got to get back to what I had. Yeah. Um, and so maybe not honoring the path back. Yeah. And I agree with that, but I'm wondering if like teaching about the connection and the function, right? If that mm-hmm. will be helpful in the process of Absolutely. Honoring. Yes, absolutely. Right. Because I think too, like we, we, we enter this in doing what's in going into pregnancy only with what we've known before, which is forms of exercise that we have loved and that have been really important to us. And we don't really understand the linea alba and mm-hmm. its role that it has to stretch. And also that, you know, coming from fitness, there's a lot of focus on the stability aspect but not so much on the other two functions of the abdominals being the movement and mobility aspect Mm -hmm. and also the breathing aspect, right? So we don't enter this huge endeavor of pregnancy and postpartum with the real understanding of what is the function of the abdominals. So maybe if we can get that really and encourage that in the postpartum classes, that can help with the, with the, Go slowly, take your time. Yeah, and get to know your body. Mm -hmm. I think that it's also kind of coming back to um, this feeling of empowerment and agency of kind of going, you know... um, you know, I used to love backbends. Backbends felt great to me. Um, they don't feel the same anymore. So maybe this instructor or this class, you know, everybody's doing that. But I, I'm actually going to stop and pause and and get this message that my body's kind of telling me that that isn't overstretching for me. You know, so I think there's a sense of like self agency here that if people could realize that in some capacity, reaching up to get a, sh- a glass of a glass from their top shelf is extension. And that might feel okay. But then if Mm -hmm. I take that into a really extreme posture in one of my classes, that's not okay. Um, And when I say not okay, it's also backing away from a sense of fear that may be evoked with this like strong set of protocol of like, no, I'm not going to do this, this or that, but more just like this sense of gently listening to our body because, um, you know, movement is part of DR recovery, collagen, which, you know, I guess the LA, the Linnea Alba consists of, of, of collagen, right? Primarily collagen. Collagen is 70% water and it also has elastin in it. So movement is an important part of this whole system. Um, and then one last thought, and I think this to me is something I've been thinking about a lot is that, you know, there's not just one set protocol. There's not like, it's really everyone's individual response to exercises that determines if it's successful. So it's not as simple as closing the gap with a specific set of exercises. There's not like the go-to parameter and the go-to top 10 things that I would tell everyone to do or not to do during the DR recovery period, because Remember, function is everything and taking strategies that you learn in rehab and then applying them to everyday life, including bigger movements, squatting, pushing, pulling, you know, that's really where that synthesis starts to connect between rehab and everyday life and not thinking about it as a protocol, but as an opportunity to understand your body better is really empowering. I think so. Absolutely. Because then we can go into beyond a postnatal class where the educator might or the teacher might have some understanding um, and trying to offer support. But when they go into a regular class, having that subtle awareness like, oh, the rest of the class is doing this. I'm not there right now. And that's okay. Or like, wow, last week I didn't feel okay with this, but look look at how I feel this week. 
I that's like right. That. Mm-hmm. That's right. And I think it's important to mention too, that when people go into more of just like a mainstream class, having that knowledge about your body and, and being aware and feeling and listening to what the instructor is saying and being able to say, is that a good cue for me? Mm -hmm. where I am right now so that you're really this educated consumer and not just trusting that what someone is seeing from the outside is what's, what's good for your body. So really blending what you're feeling on the inside and you decide like, should I be doing those cues or not? And I think also with respect to movement and there being no real, real protocol for DR, I think we have to understand that the body really likes variability. The body thrives on variability. So if we're doing the same thing, and you know this just from exercise in general, right? Like if you do the same five or 10 exercises a day, you're not going to feel that anymore. So it's time to like mix it up. So we have to keep varying things and looking just how does, how do the muscles connect into the linea alba, looking at the directions of the fibers coming from the rib cage, the pelvis, and can I get different movements that work with how everything connects into there with sort of this like fan and basket weave that connects into there as opposed to just what we think of being stabilization and more linear and safe exercises. How can we get this variability in a mindful way where we feel connected? And that's what the body's going to thrive on. Mm, I like that a lot. And on that note, we're going to take a quick break. And then when we come back, I'm going to have you guys tell me your final tip or advice for new and expected parents and then where people can find your work. So hold on one second. Waiting on a tax return? Hopefully it ends up in your hands. Fraudulent tax returns due to identity theft increased by 30% in 2023. If you're in a bind this tax season, LifeLock can help. Our U.S.-based restoration specialists are experts dedicated to helping solve your identity theft issues. And all LifeLock plans are backed by the Million Dollar Protection Package. So we'll reimburse you up to the limits of your plan if you lose money due to identity theft. Help protect your information this tax season with LifeLock. Save up to 25% your first year at LifeLock.com slash aware. And we're back. <laughs> All right. So who wants to go first on their final tip or advice for new and expectant parents? I'll, I'll go. Um, so I was thinking a lot about this one and I tried to distill it down to just one. <laughs> um, and I would say the one that kind of kept coming back was a question that I receive a lot, which is, is there anything that I can do during pregnancy to avoid or reduce my risk of ab separation. And, and this is kind of, this is the the message that I usually like to, like to impart. And, you know, I, I gently remind people that by the third trimester, all women will have a separation. This is normal. And what our tissues are really supposed to be doing to make room for baby. Um, and there, there are, there are things you can do to reduce the pressure on your tummy. However, you know, so you can have your core assessed, uh, where an OT or PT can help you coordinate and think about your muscles as a team, which is what they really are. Um, you know, and we do know a stronger core during pregnancy has the benefit of a better recovery postpartum. Um, and then avoiting repetition, repet- repetitious that's another tongue twister, repetitious um, exercises that increase interabdominal pressure. And I, I'm thinking about everyday life. So like avoid straining on the toilet, avoid activities that make your abdomen bulge. Um, these are the types of things that we cover in a prenatal session with a pelvic floor therapist. So we teach you strategies for reducing abdominal pressure, modifying everyday activities, Thinking about alignment, right? Because alignment and posture play a vital role in your healing and you can really rebuild your structure uh, and set yourself up for optimal function, strength, and success by just stacking your bones. Mm. (laughs) Great. And that was incredibly, that was incredibly well said. So I echo all of that. (laughs) And just, just that always follow function. So if you, if you embody function, you cannot go wrong. So when you're looking at how to connect to the linea alba and the abdominals, think about their primary function. So there's a stabilization function, there's a breathing function, and there's a movement function. 
So are you getting a balance in the training that you're doing of those three aspects? So that's what I'll leave you with. We always want a balance. And if we're heavy on the stabilization, we want to go into more of the breathing and more into the movement in an embodied way. I love that because I feel like all of us could use balance in every aspect of our life. I talk a lot about in class about functional movement helps with the functional birth and balance of the pelvis and pelvic floor and just mind. So I love that you really put on that the highlight on balance because I don't I think a lot of us live without that imbalance. Um, so where can people find your work? Yeah. So um, my website is. Complete Core NYC, so www.completecorenyc.com. And in February, I have a pelvic power workshop that I'm teaching at the Open Center. So that's going to be all about embodying the pelvis, the abdominals, breathing, uh, diaphragm. So that's a must attend. Um, and I do visits throughout the city um, and some work in my home studio in Tribeca. Okay. Wonderful. And you guys also, the Facebook group, um, is that, am I, am I not supposed to be talking about that? You have a private Facebook group. <laughs> I guess no, it's not know, private. I can edit this out if we need. Yeah. No, the Facebook group, you know, we're a growing community. So I encourage if you are a trainer or if you are a dancer, you are anyone who teaches movement and you're working with women and you're curious about the pelvic floor, I think you should attend because there's so much that you can learn from this community and also that you can share your knowledge as well. You know, like we're always looking to hear um, from everyone's experience too. So that, that the, the that's notes. called... It's, um, I think it's Pelvic Health NYC, and um, while it's primarily composed of New York City practitioners, um, because we've been doing a lot of virtual recordings as well, you know, I, I encourage any professionals outside of the New York area, if they're interested in joining, to do so as well. I have loved that. It is such in-depth inviting information. The fact that as a community, you're getting together and really diving deep into this and making it available for everyone... Thank you. Thank you for that. It is such a treat to be able to sit in on that community, even if I'm not there. So, Lindsay, where are you? Where are people finding your work? Yeah. So, you can find me on my website, which is functionalpelvis.com. I not only have that uh, free video on C-section and perineal massage recovery, uh, but there's also a handout. But there's also a 16-page book called Caring for Your Floor, Back, and Pelvic Floor. It's really meant to be a guide for moms in early postpartum stage, so those first six weeks when sometimes you can kind of feel like you're not so sure where to turn and what you're supposed to be doing. It was really intended to fill that gap. Um, you can also find me on Instagram, Functional Pelvis, um, as well as Facebook, Functional Pelvis. Wonderful. And I'll make sure I have all of this. I've been taking notes <laughs> throughout our talk about, <laughs> make sure I put this in the show notes and this in the show notes. So I'll make sure everything's linkable. Oh, thank you guys so much. I so enjoyed this conversation. It answered a lot of questions that I had that I think our community had. And it's just so exciting to share this. Oh, thank you for having us. It's yeah. such an important conversation. We just appreciate the opportunity to, to spread and, the knowledge. Yeah. And I think Lindsay, this is our third podcast. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> I love it. Such a, oh, such, such a privilege. Yeah. All right. Well, have a great afternoon. Be well. You, you right. too. Bye-bye. Bye. Hi, friends. All right. So after we finished the conversation, Lindsay Solange and I, I was feeling a little unsettled with the fact that I didn't think we gave enough structure and guidelines for yoga teachers within a classroom setting and students. So Solange is back with me. Hi, Solange. Hi. <laughs> I'm so happy to continue this conversation. I know, because we could geek out on this for a while. So we're just going to add a tiny bit more about if you're a yoga teacher and you have a class setting, what are some ideas to think about in terms of what's appropriate for reconstructing the body and uh, exploring, um, rebuilding the postpartum body? And if you're a student, also finding some explorations. So what I wanted to cover is that when you're in a class setting, we can't just kind of throw out and say, oh, it's up to the student, because as teachers, we know we do need to have a container of safety. So I'm going to open this to Solange just to talk a little bit about that, and then we can get a little bit more into a few specific areas of poses, Um, but we'll keep it brief. All right. 
Hi, Solange. Let me hear your thoughts. Hi. Yeah, so, you know what? I'm, I'm really happy to be talking about this. And I think the guidelines are really, really important because we have to remember that we're teaching to the group and we have to keep it safe. So I think what's really important when we're looking about backbends and diastasis is how are, how are we moving? How are we moving the pelvis? How are we moving the spine? And a lot of times what we see is the pelvis is not moving and by not moving and backbending, we feel a pushing forward of the abs or a bulging. So really giving the students a sense of let's move the pelvis and having a slight bend in the knees, slight bend at the hips. So the pelvis is actually free to move when we backbend. So we get a nice movement in all areas versus a just pushing and locking into one. So I think that's really, really important. And I think that's certainly something that our teachers can give guidance to and to the students in terms of how to differentiate that movement versus when is the pelvis not moving? When is the pelvis and spine moving together? How things move in different areas. And when we're in the poses as well, I think we want to explore in something that's a little bit more safe. So we can do our exploration in like a cat cow or if we're standing and doing kind of dancing so we can flex and extend side bend and rotate. So doing stuff and feeling in that position where it's not the extreme of a pose and seeing what that feels like. And then we can then take, okay, that safe feeling of being connected and having a gentle rotation and working within a nice mid range. And let's see if we can apply that to other things that we do in yoga. Yes. It's not that you can't backbend. In fact, we do a lot of chest opening is we have to look at the whole picture of what's appropriate right now. Like if someone's just back from having a baby, you know, a full wheel pose is probably not (laughs) super appropriate. We don't want to push that abdomen further. And also as you and I were talking about, like twisting is great for loosening up the upper back, but again, how deep are we twisting and how much are we churning? How much overstretch? So we want to just look at the pose within a container. Within a container and two, a a lot of times I see just, it's like the end result Mm -hmm. is the pose versus how we're getting into the pose. So if we think about guy, letting, letting the cues that we hear from our teacher and the cues that we feel in our body, which would be our connection to our linea alba and thinking about how the muscles move us as we move into a rotation, we wouldn't go right to that point and hook the elbow and put it on the knee. We wouldn't, we would say, okay, here's my linea alba. As I rotate, I'm feeling not a lengthening and a big, like I'm going to pull things apart. There's a nice gentle compression. And yeah, that's the point where I, where it feels safe to stop with the guidance of however the teacher is, is cueing the students in class. Yeah. That's so that perfect. would feel more like it's working with what feels right to you. It's matching the cues that you're given in class with the cues in your body versus just the end result. And I think it's always, it's like, we don't want, just want to get into that pose. It's like how we're moving into it, how we're moving out of it is actually more important. Than and the, the exploration itself. of the pose is leading up to that pose. So maybe some of the class, you know, if we're looking at like a postnatal class, you could have someone that's six weeks and six months, that six month person might've spent a lot of time really finding and incorporating their abs again and finding that core flexibility and strength and balance. And maybe they are actually hooking the knee, but someone earlier, you're not there. So respecting also the stages and the stages of poses to get into it. So maybe that person's hooking, but someone else is going more to the midline. So we're still twisting. We just don't need to see that final picture. We need to kind of honor where the body is presenting itself. Yeah. And I think that's the beauty too, with looking through the internal lens, right? Like staying focused on ourself as the individual and not looking at what our neighbor is doing. Mm -hmm. It's like, we're working with where we are right now. And this is our journey and everyone's journey is different. Great. I love that. So we're talking about looking at back bends again, not the full range twists, not the full range until someone's body feels ready to do so. And you and I also talked about plank briefly about sometimes in plank people hold their breath and that ends pushing, ends up pushing the abdominal wall out, or there's not a sense of pelvis and core as I'm sitting here, like wiggling, trying to feel that. (laughs) 
<laughs> but, but even when we're in, when we tend to be just in a static position, if we lose sight of the breath and the breath is still moving, it can become a brace, which is a pushing outward versus right. what we want, which is more of an accordion where we expand and we contract. And it's, and that's what makes a static pose dynamic. Mm-hmm. So passing through the position would be okay. Not holding yeah. it for a minute. Necessarily, <laughs> which I know some places do. So again, looking, there are poses, but how do they fit into the postpartum individual within the class setting? Yeah. And, and just, and I think that ties into too, that it's not just like the end result being the pose, but like how we're getting into it, how we're moving into what's coming before what's coming after and sort of this idea of it being more fluid than just yeah. you're going to hold it and stay there. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm so glad. We're not static beings. No, and especially (laughs) in the way we do it at prenatal yoga center, we do a lot of dynamic movement because it, you know, invites breathing and breathing is just going to help your body be more happier. (laughs) And I think too, just the idea that how somehow plank defines strength, Mm -hmm. it doesn't, right? Plank is just one pose and many people can feel good about that pose, but really it's again, are we addressing the function of the core? So are we addressing the movement? Are we addressing the breathing? Are we addressing the stability? And if we look at those three functions in the poses that we do, right, it might make us think like, do I want to be doing this? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Maybe we do, maybe and we don't. Exactly. Maybe there's a time for it and maybe there's not. Well, I'm so <laughs> glad that we added this little segment to our conversation. I just think it's going to help Me too. teachers understand how to approach um, when there's diastasis or pelvic floor issues as well as students. So I love that it's not about the end result. It's about the journey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. You're yeah. welcome. Okay. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies, produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening. Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on ChumbaCasino.com. I looked over at the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino-style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's ChumbaCasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. VGW. Void. we prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.